All right. Well, I got the idea for this discussion when I came across an article in which the chief technology officer of a top consulting firm was quoted as saying that in the near future, these, these new technologies were going to empower him to demand more prestige at his company, a fancier office and a bigger budget. Uh, no, I, he, what he said out loud was something else. What he said out loud was that this new technology was going to uh, <laughs> really have a, a big effect on the, on the knowledge management function at his company. And uh, I, I saw the phrase knowledge management and I immediately realized that I have a longtime friend, uh, Stan Garfield, who is recognized as a leader in the field of knowledge management. So I asked him to join the discussion. And then uh, he said, well, this guy, Dennis Pierce, is a, an expert in, in AI and computers, and so you should have him on. And so that's, that's what we, we've got here. So I'd, I'd like you guys to give us uh, two minutes each of a little bit more of an introduction of yourself. You know, so Stan, in, in two minutes or less, not only uh, introduce yourself, but maybe explain to my audience what knowledge management is, again, less than two minutes, and then what, you know, sort of where would they look on the internet to uh, see the justification for my calling you a leader in the field? All right, thanks, Arnold, and thanks for inviting Dennis and me to join you today. Um, so knowledge management, to start with that, is essentially the ability of an organization to reuse what one part of the organization knows in another part. So it's an attempt to take full advantage of the knowledge, skills, and expertise of an entire organization so that you don't reinvent the wheel, make mistakes over and over again, and you take full advantage of everyone that's there. It becomes more and more important as organizations grow large. So if you have a small team, it's usually easy for everyone to know what each one knows and does and just talk to each other to take advantage of their background. But in larger organizations, that's pretty hard. So knowledge management attempts to deal with that through a variety of mechanisms so that people can get in touch with each other, including people that they don't know, but are able to help one another out at the time of need. And it involves both capturing knowledge and reusing knowledge for the benefit of the organization. That's, that's one way of summarizing it. My own background in it is that I was doing it for many years before we had a name for it. I worked in the uh, computer industry and the consulting business for a long time, but somewhere in the mid nineties, we started to see the term knowledge management. And in 1996, I was asked to start the first knowledge management program for Digital Equipment Corporation. Some of you may remember that company. It was actually the number two computer company in the world at one time uh, behind IBM before it eventually disappeared altogether. But I started knowledge management as a full-time job in 1996 and essentially been in the field ever since. And as far as where you can go to find out more about why not, uh, Arnold invited me, if you Google my name, Stan Garfield, go to my site, which is on Google Sites. You'll get a wealth of information about it more than you can possibly digest. So you probably need to use chat GPT to help simple, simplify. Okay. And so you've written more than just one or two tweets that had the word knowledge management in. That's right. I've written four books now on knowledge management, contributed chapters to another um, other books and writing blogs for a long time since 2006 and have a regular series of blogs with a company called Lucidia and um, doing a series of webinars for them on something called the five C's of knowledge management. So if you're interested in that, information will be available on my website and you can attend those for free. Okay, now Dennis, you I guess supposedly know something about computers. Did you like take a night course in COBOL at some point or what's your uh, deal? No, actually it was Fortran, not COBOL. Uh, but right. uh, uh, yeah, I'm not definitely not a, an expert in computers and AI, I wouldn't call it that. I um, most of my career was spent at uh, IBM and then Lexmark, the printer company that was spun off from IBM's uh, printer division in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, when I was at IBM, uh, this was in the late 80s, I did some work uh, creating some expert systems and uh, that rolled over into Lexmark. 
um, also creating some uh, case-based reasoning systems there, uh, sort of the, the old school AI, not the uh, deep learning kind of things that are going on now. Um, and uh, transition actually, um, the way I got into knowledge management was actually through AI because I was uh, doing this AI work at Lexmark and uh, went to this uh, conference in Boston in the late 90s that uh, talked about knowledge management because it seemed to relate to some of the AI work I was doing. And there I got a broader picture of what knowledge management was and got very interested in that, ended up coming back at Lexmark. I got a um, PhD at the University of Kentucky in um, decision sciences and information systems uh, along the way. And uh, I have not been actively doing that. I retired uh, from Lexmark in 2017. And the last four years I've been working uh, as a collaboration strategist for a, a nonprofit uh, based out of Chicago uh, called Start Early that um, does research and provides training to teachers for uh, early childhood education. And so um, I manage their uh, collaboration tools and systems there. Um, so I've not been you know, deep into developing AI for a while, but I'm more of a strongly interested bystander these days. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay, well, I'll get back to you with a question. It'll probably take me about 10 minutes to get there. The question that I have is just what is this uh, reinforcement learning human feedback that I hear about with chat GPT? Um, you know, it sounds to me like, I mean, you know, some guy in greasy overalls with a tool belt crawls into the algorithm, holds up a flashlight and says, well, we're going to have to put an if statement here and we're going to connect a subroutine there. I mean, anyway, I have no idea what 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 that is, but uh, hold off. Uh, uh, just I'm going to it'll take me a little while to get there just to let people know I want to end <laughs> by the time we're finished here, get into some really kind of big questions like a skeptic who's aware of the unreliability of chat GPT is bound to ask at some point, how can something that unreliable be useful in knowledge management? So that, you know, that's a question we'll get to later. And then the uh, uh, kind of a, the, a question that the optimist, uh, the evangelist for chat GPT would ask is, uh, is this technology and the AI technologies that are kind of following behind it, right behind it, uh, how radically are they going to change knowledge work itself, let's say over the next seven years? So that's that that's another question that we'll get to. Uh, but first I just want to first I just want to start with a little rant, uh, which is that um, chat the large language models and chat GPT in particular, they don't know what they're reading and they don't know what they're writing. I mean, it, it really is true that the, it has no idea what it's re reading, no idea what it's writing. It's just parsing. Uh, you know, if, if you're a human being, but probably the last time you did parsing was in middle school when your teacher gave you a problem of order of operations. And so you had to say, all right, well, this is what I do with the parentheses. <laughs> you know, this is, uh, by the way, give me a thumbs up if you're hearing. If you're not, okay, good. All right, so, um, so the, the, you know, so what do you do with the parentheses? What do you do with the exponents? You know, what do you do next? What do you do next? And what I, the way I think of chat beat, GPT composing answers is playing a game of what comes next. So if it started to write Little Red Riding, the next thing it would write would be Hood, because you know in all the billions and billions of sentences that it's been trained on, every time it's seen Little Red Riding, those three tokens, I mean, don't even call them words, call them tokens, Little Red Riding, that what comes after it is hood. And so that's what it's gonna write. And that's how, how it proceeds to go. And now if it had only written little red, then it, on that basis, it wouldn't know whether to follow that up with riding or wagon or barn or, or whatever. 
I mean, it would have a very limited number of tokens that could follow Little Red with, but it couldn't, it, you know, it couldn't just pick any token. Uh, and so it would probably have to look at the context of other tokens. So let's say I asked, um, you know, but anyway, so to me, like parsing is like digestion. It's not like thinking, you know, the people are treating chat GPT as if it's thinking and they're asking you questions if it's thinking. It's actually, it's more like digestion. You, you, you put these tokens, the sequence of tokens in there, you feed it the sequence of tokens and sort of these enzymes go to work, breaking them down and kind of reconstituting them. And then finally it craps out an answer. And that's, um, <laughs> you know, that that's kind of what what I think of it as doing is this kind of parsing. So let's say I ask chat GPT, what should I get my wife for Valentine's Day? It's going to gi give an answer of the form for Valentine's Day, you should get your wife because that's the natural sequence. You know, if someone asks a question of the form for blah, blah, blah day, what should I get? blah, 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 it's going to know, well, to respond for that day, you should get blah, blah, you know, so it might say something like for Valentine's Day, you should get your wife a box of chocolates, because those are the tokens that it kind of sees, and that's kind of the order that it sees them, uh, you know, in its billions and billions of, of, of sentences that, it, that, it's, that it's seen. And uh, on the other hand, I could say, well, I'm at the florist. What should I get my wife for Valentine's Day? And it'll say, it'll say well, it'll, it'll notice the token florist. And then it might come back with something for Valentine's Day. You should get your wife a bouquet of red roses. Okay. So anyway, you know, but it's, um, it, it, anyway, I, I don't think it's thinking. It, it's just processing these things. Um, and it, it can get very uh, articulate at that. I mean, it, the, the sentences will be very articulate, but the content is what's not reliable. That, you know, people have, who've read about it have read about the phenomenon of hallucinations. And the very first time I, I put a question in, and you can tell what my ego is, I, I said, write an essay about Arnold Kling, the economist. And it starts out, Arnold Kling is an economist. He was, <laughs> he was born in uh, New York City in 1961. So structurally, that's the right answer. Content-wise, it's completely wrong. I was born in St. Louis in 1954, not in New York in 1961. You know, it just, you know, the <laughs> probably in its corpus of billions and billions of sentences that it's read, it included me next to another economist who was born in New York City in 1961 and so came out with that answer. Um, anyway, so that's that's enough on that. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me. So then uh, there's this phenomenon of how this was corrected because obviously if this was all you had and, and, and this was just the way it worked and there was nothing you could do about it, 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 it would be a joke. But there's this other element, other element to creating it, which is called, I think, reinforcement learning human feedback. And now I'm going to get back to you, Dennis, and say, can you, how does that actually, you know, what, what are the steps in that? What's the recipe for reinforcement learning human feedback? Um, that's a good question. And uh, <laughs> to be honest, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes uh, with chat GPD. Uh, I, I, I do know that um, they do have mechanisms both for um, doing their own adjustments and for uh, taking the responses and in, in the conversations that people have with it. Uh, I, I, in fact, I think uh, the, the people who were in the SIKM uh, session might have seen some of the things I posted. I can't remember I posted this, but I had a lengthy argument with it um, where it was convinced that birds were mammals. And um, 
we seem to go round and round where part of the reason was because bats are mammals and bats fly and birds fly. And, and then, uh, you know, every time I tried to ask it another question, it would skirt around and end up <clears throat> back around again. But within a few days, that seemed to have been corrected. Um, and so uh, now it's aware that birds are not mammals. So uh, I don't know, you know, with as many people as are, you know, testing it right now, I can't imagine that there's some set of people back there taking all this in and manually, you know, making these changes because it would just be overwhelming. Um, yeah. But uh, so that's there, that's yeah. Well, that is it's interesting mystery. I mean, I hear the word reinforcement, and I, I think of sort of you know training a dog, and it does what you want it to do, and you give it a treat, and it doesn't. It does it something wrong and you slap it on the nose. And I think if you use chat GPT, you can give it like a thumbs up or thumbs down. Am mm -hmm. I correct on these things? And so that's yes. like giving it, giving it a treat or uh, slapping it on the nose. But I guess what I was wondering is, does it respond automatically? Or is it like you say that, that the humans have to kind of, you know, look through these, you know, uh, these transcripts and then like you know like my guy with the overalls walk in there and you know, <laughs> make an if statement and a subroutine call and just so so if, if anyone out there is more familiar with it and wants to uh give me give me a better sense of what that uh what that looks like that would be that would be uh, you're, you're welcome to kind of raise your hand or whatever uh -huh. what, one thing I have found interesting about it is that um, you can, and, and maybe that's a question you ask it and see what it says. I, I've found when I'm not sure how it works, I ask it questions about itself and uh, it's able to respond. Um, I, yeah. I was, in fact, this morning I got curious because I've never seen it respond in, in the dialogues I've had with it. I've never seen it respond with a question back to me. You know, so I, I was wondering, well, can it even do that? So this morning I asked it, can, do you just issue statements based on, you know, the questions people ask you, or do you ever ask questions back? And it says, I ask questions back, you know, clarifying questions. It's, it's obviously, and in fact, it even said that it's not going to ask original questions, um, but it can ask clarifying questions. And so I said, well, can you give me an example of one? And it said, sure. In fact, it even said, sure. Uh, <laughs> it, it said, uh, for instance, if somebody says, I need help with something, I'll ask, what do you need help with? And I thought, well, that's about the most vague, you know, Prompt. response you can get. <laughs> uh, so I don't, I don't think it does a very good job of, uh, if at all, of clarifying, uh, asking clarifying questions. Like your example, of the um, the Valentine's Day gift, a, a human might say, "Well, does your wife like chocolate?" Before they recommend chocolate, you know, just to make sure that they're not recommending something that could be ruled out instantly. It doesn't seem to have that that capability. The um, you know the most interesting story I've heard, and it's a story that's too good to check, but I, the, the the guy who who alluded to it. Uh, I, th I think is reliable. And the story is somebody put a prompt in and I forget what the content of the prompt was. They got that answer back. I think it was a uh -uh kind of answer. And they said, well, what would a really smart AI, how would a really smart AI answer this question? And they got a much smarter, more sophisticated answer. And what that brings up is the element that I, I call simulation. You know, in some sense, both of those answers were simulations. The first answer it was simulating like a you know a, a nondescript AI, and the second answer was it was simulating a sophisticated AI. Um, and it, it just strikes me that some of the most interesting use cases and abuse cases come from this ability to simulate. You know, so people have talked about you know taking some modern pop song and saying, write it like, um, you know, like Shakespeare and, you know, that, that kind of simulation. And I was thinking, you know, about 10 years ago, maybe more, maybe 15 years ago now, 
uh, this guy, John Popola, who is a uh, film director, and Russ Roberts, who's an economist, collaborated on a rap video between two early 20th century econ famous economists, Friedrich Hayek and John Maynard Keynes, and it was quite a hit. So, but in effect, they were creating a simulation of in the, you know, 10 years ago of these guys who lived 100 years ago, arguing about you know, the fundamentals of economics. It was very entertaining, very educational. But the amount of work they had to go through to create that was just you know, intense. It probably took more than a year of writing a script to get you know, like a, a five to 10 minute video. And then they've had to find actors. And all that stuff now would be available uh, through these new AIs. Uh, so that you could, you know, you could maybe throw that together. You could throw a mediocre version of that together, you know, in a few days. You know, if you probably to get a really good script, you need humans to to think of more clever lines. Uh, but the the simulation possibilities, the other simulation possibility that intrigues me is is you know is mentors. You know, I don't know if you've heard, remember the movie Stand and Deliver. I don't know. Do you know what that's with this calculus teacher? Who was just great out in Los Angeles? Well, you imagine you could, you know, put it out a, you know, turn every calculus teacher into a simulated version of him, uh, using some of this technology. Um, so that's great. But then you have the abuse cases, which I think people have already had to deal with. I mean, somebody, you know, uh, you know, suppose somebody decided to put out a, a simulation of you know Stan and Barb doing something nasty or simulation of Stan being assassinated. You know, those are, you know, those things are very real possibilities and create real challenges. I don't know, Stan, do you have any sense of, of the of the of the simulation use and abuse cases? Do you have any thoughts on on the pitfalls or promises of that? I haven't thought about the, the example you just gave and hopefully won't come to pass, but the um... <laughs> The uh, opportunity <clears throat> part of it, I think we've already all started to internalize what some of the risks and dangers are. But I hadn't really given a lot of thought to all the opportunities until I started playing with it today and putting in uh, the use cases that I had for knowledge management. And the answers that I got back to me suggests that there is a lot of potential there I've defined in my writing over the years, 50 different components of knowledge management. So I went through trying to think about which ones would this maybe apply to. I thought it'd be maybe a handful of them. It turned out that I came up with 32 out of the 50 that it could apply to. And then I went back and I asked it for each one of those 32, what can chat GPT do for this? And it gave me back, in most cases, reasonable answers. There was a few that just seemed like a little bit forced, but otherwise, they, they were coherent, they made sense. And if they were in fact valid, they would really help knowledge management. Like right? they could do a much better job of creating user interfaces, much better job of responding to search queries and so forth. And then the other tests that I put it through of just asking it questions, it seemed like it came back with pretty good answers. Just like you were talking, Arnold, I put in the question about Valentine's Day and I've reproduced it here in the chat. It seemed like a pretty reasonable answer that it came back with. So I think. There's plenty of risks and dangers, but I think on the surface, the, the value that it can provide, that, that's what I, I, I'm more focused on, I would say. Can you give an example of, of one of those things where it came up with something that you hadn't sort of considered and seemed like a, a, an in, interesting use case? Well, for instance, I asked it, uh, what can, how it can be used for training, as an example, and it says it can be used for content generation, generating training materials such as lesson plans, modules, and presentations. It can, it can do a virtual instructor, uh, integrated into a virtual learning platform to provide personalized interactive training experiences. It can answer questions related to the training material. It can do assessment generation to generate assessments and quizzes, ensuring learners have a solid understanding of the material. Adaptive learning, it can be used to tailor training experiences based on the learner's progress, preferences, and needs. Well, if that's all true, and of course we could be skeptical about it. It's pretty good. That's yeah. In other words, <laughs> yeah. 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 Use that. And, and that's and, just and, one and, thing. And I've got to believe you could do that for like, you know, a 10-year-old. 
right? You could, you know, you could have a very enthusiastic, encouraging mentor for a 10 year old and just, uh, you know, it's, it, that, that would be amazing. But, yeah. uh, but what do, does the reliability issue bother you for knowledge management at all, either Stan or Dennis? Well, I would say that if you're going to use it, there's going to be two distinct use variations. One is focused on the general knowledge that, in the world at large, which is where most of us have been experimenting with it. And then there's the potential use where you focus it on the knowledge and resources within an enterprise or within an organization. If you can properly do that, if you can turn it loose on all of an organization's content, and then it can do the same thing that it, it's done with the more universal content. And that's a big question because as we know, Google, the search engine is different than internal search engines by a big, big margin because of the differences in scale. But assuming that it can work similarly on internal content, then yeah, I'd say I, I wouldn't be too worried about the, the negative side of that. I'd, I'd be excited about how it could do a lot better job of finding content and serving it up in useful formats than what we currently do with cobbling together stuff from you know search results and so forth. Dennis, you have any thoughts there? Yeah, um, I um, I looked at a couple of things I saw, you might have seen recently in the news. Um, you know, now uh, universities are giving it tests, uh, like uh, I think uh, was it Wharton, the, the MBA Wharton. Um, uh, operations management test, and gave it a B minus or something like that, and then. Um, CNET was using it to write articles for uh, money and had a bunch of errors. But the errors in both cases seemed to be math errors, which I thought was sort of funny that um, in order to make it more human, you make it poorer at math than a computer is. Um, and I, I think maybe people are, you know, thinking this is like, you know, the Wizard of Oz or something that it knows everything. But I, if you think of it more as an explainer rather than a calculator, I think that's where its its niche area is. And when you were talking about simulations and, and then just recently what Stan was talking about too, I think the ability to take a concept and explain it at whatever level is appropriate for the person asking the question uh, could be really valuable. And just this morning, I, I pulled up an old paper I, I remembered from a long time ago, an AI paper that I thought uh, has some relevance here and I was reading through it and um, the guy who wrote it uh, was talking about horn clauses and I remembered them vaguely uh, but I didn't remember exactly what they were so I had chat you know GPT up and I, I said what's a horn clause and it gave me this explanation that seemed to come right out of a logic um, math textbook and so I just responded back and I said can you explain that at the level that a high schooler would understand. And it came back with a very nice, simpler explanation. So to your point about a 10 year old, you know, I think, I, and maybe also the idea of in the opposite direction, what you said before about um, the AI, you know, sophisticated AI, it might provide an explanation at, at, at a default level. And then if you come back and ask for a different level of explanation, it can tailor it up or down depending on the sophistication of the of the reader. So I think that kind of thing could be really powerful. Um, you know, if you, if you want to do the math calculation to see what the interest rate is or whatever, then we've got other tools for that. Maybe this is not the right tool for that. Yeah, the uh, reminds me that uh, just today uh, a, a blogger that I, f I follow, Tyler Cowen, said that he now reads with chat gpt so if he's reading about some foreign country and and a region gets mentioned that he doesn't know anything about he'll just you know ask chat gpt to tell him about what he needs to know about that region uh so he can kind of you know go back and forth and, and kind of follow the follow the book he says it's like having 10 books open at the same time um the uh i, I want to ask one more question and then i i hope the audience is kind of primed to to uh jump in uh, and that's the, this big question of what will knowledge work, work look like, so let's say, in 2037 years from now? Will it be about the same now 
or radically different. And I'm leaning toward the radically different. So those, you know, knowledge workers, they're what Robert Reich used to call symbol analysts, people who deal in words or equations or computer code. Um, you know, if, if you follow the software industry, I mean, it is being turned upside down because chat GPT is just great as a putting together what they call an IDE, which I forget, you know, integrated development environment or whatever. I mean, yeah. people, people can produce software just incredibly faster, the, those skilled people. And I, you could sort of see the same thing happening in all these fields. Again, being able to put together, you know, a, a, a complex video in, you know, in, in days that would have taken, you know, months or years to, to put together. Um, so let me ask the question this way. Suppose I say that, um, you know, there's a 75% a chance that seven years from now, the tools that we've seen and that are coming down the pike will be an absolute necessity for someone to be uh, an employable knowledge worker. They, they'll have to be able to work with those tools or they'll, you know, they just won't be, uh, it won't be productive at all. You know, I say that well, there's this like it looks to me like there's at least a seventy five percent chance that that scenario plays out. Stan, do you have an opinion? Would you go over or under? I th I think you're you're right, Arnold. I think you you didn't you write that you thought it would be a good time for people to start a business using ChatGPT. Yeah. yeah. So that's sort of another statement of its potential impact, isn't it? So I think you're right. This is very similar to me as an inflection point, as you pointed out in one of your blogs about the, the World Wide Web. Right? To me, it has that kind of potential impact. Dennis, you have a... Yeah, I think things will change in, in two different directions. One is things like this, um, especially you know, as, as more people are working uh, remotely, what, what you don't get when you're working remotely is the person sitting in the cubicle next to you that you can lean over and ask a question and say, hey, do you know how to do this? Um, it just in a casual way. And I think GPD, GPT can do, you know, take the place of some of that um, where, hey, do you know how to, you know, I, I've got this JavaScript, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Can you give me an idea, how to, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Stan mentioned uh, finding content too. Um, one of the challenges in organizations is always uh, keeping content organized because people don't, they always want everybody else's content organized, but they don't want to organize their own for the benefit of other people. And if, uh, and I tested this the other day, my wife was thinking about starting a business. I live in South Carolina. So I asked Chat GPT, you know, um, where are the forms uh, to start a business in South Carolina? And it came back and said, they're on the Secretary of State's you know, website. Um, but it didn't give me a link. It just said, that's where they are. So I, I asked, I followed up. I said, do you have a link? Gave me the link, not just to the website, but to the page on the website where the forms were. Um, what I was thinking was, you know, if, if this means that people can just dump their stuff into their systems in any old way they want and not have to worry about it. And, and something like chat and GPT can, you know, scan all of that and figure out where everything is and just tell you where it is whenever you need to know that's pretty powerful the other the flip side i was thinking of is every technology ends up shaping the the way the information the knowledge is formed because there's a um, there's an iterative kind of thing right where um for instance um people generate, uh, have a button to create a, a CSV file to be able to export into Excel. So there's some structure to that data specifically for a tool. I've, I've read the companies are telling, um, you know, applicants not to bother with a, a cover letter with their resume because the resume is being ingested into a, a, an a automatic, you know, system. Um, so many websites are designed for SEO, you know, uh, even more so than the actual content. So I would not be surprised that if if something like G, um, Chat GPT gets sort of downsized to where it could be deployed within an organization um, or even on the web, 
Um, once people start to get the feeling for like how it's ingesting this information, and they're probably going to go check their own content against it to see what it's saying about about them, they'll probably start tweaking their content in a way that makes it you know as palatable as possible whenever these tools use it. So there's a sort of you know iterative kind of backward uh, loop yeah. that that changes the, the shape of our knowledge to fit the tools we're using versus the other way around. Yeah, those are all great observations. About the last one, I remember, like I remember when I had my commercial website in the in the nineties, and um, you know, we we at first we were focused a lot on the design of the home page because people were going to come to it from the home page. But then once the search process took took over, people were just were coming into the back pages, and you had to completely rethink. You know, how am I going to accomplish what I want from, you know, from the website's point of view, get people where they, where we want them to be when they're coming in to, to different pages, they're not coming through the home page. And the, what the, your last point reminded me of that. And um, anyway, so I, I, I do want to, I, I, I suspect we have a very interesting audience. So if, let me just get a get a gallery view up and if people want to put up their virtual hands and please don't make long comments just because i think there'll be other people who who want to talk i suspect but if you'll raise virtual hands or maybe physical hands i'll be able to see it in some of you um and uh and then i can call on people and again try, try not to give long speeches and you know as they say on jeopardy be sure it's in the form of a question by the end or it doesn't absolutely have to be but i'll do that okay so jc can i ask you to unmute yeah can you hear me yeah yeah so uh you ask a, a lot of question about uh chat gpt and knowledge management so I think one way to look at it is uh, as a knowledge assistant. And you ask the question, will it uh, fundamentally uh, revolutionize the, the knowledge worker? The answer is yes. So how do we do that? And I'll give you some example I've been doing with ChatGPT. Um, I needed to write some code. Uh, I can write code, but I asked him to write code for me. And he wrote code for me, OK? So um, I ask him to write uh, a blog. So I give him some information. And what is very important to understand with those generative models is to introduce the context of what you're doing. So you can ask the assistant, chat GPT says, imagine you are a lawyer and I need a contract in, who is following the rule of the state of California, uh, et cetera. And it will provide you with a contract following the rule of state of California. So now the question here is how do you trust the answers? And there is always this degree of what is an expert, right? So if I'm a novice and I'm looking for an answer of a domain I have no knowledge about, you know, uh, I get an answer. I have not really a way to appreciate can I trust this answer? If I have some domain knowledge, uh, I can use some of my uh, knowledge in that domain to appreciate the validity of that answer. But what I see happening is that those generative models will come into the enterprise, already chat GPD as an API, and you could train the model with your own enterprise data. And what Stan said, which is very relevant, companies basically they do a terrible job of organizing the internal data and a model like a, a tool like chat gpt will do a much better model than that and today companies are using search engine but search engine you can i encourage anyone who has a, a company to go into the uh, search engine log the number of keywords given in a search engine is an average of two or less Okay, so there is a there's a limitation of the technology by the human interaction to the technology, and this number has not changed for the last fifteen years. Uh, I, I I'm the former chief knowledge of uh, officer of Microsoft. I can tell you that I talked to the Bing, my big colleague, and internally it was the same number. So uh, I think there will be a fundamental change there. Fundamental change because we will accelerate 
the task we will give better result to most of the basic tasks where the system would have to improve is everything that is reasoning which we we see is not ready to do that but i think we are like touching the first universal uh you know knowledge assistant and they would need some specialization there uh, and i think as the time comes back uh, it goes on we would see tremendous improvement it's a little bit like you and i are probably the age of the slide ruler okay <laughs> and then we had the ti calculator and then we had we used programming in fortran right so this this transformation of a tool going from a slide ruler to <coughs> a computer certainly is what's happening with ai right now and those kind of models so i think yes it will be extremely uh, transformative and for the other reason that it's available everywhere yeah. and i would say okay sorry would, uh, i'm going to have yeah. to ask you to wrap it up because so i'm sure other people are talking and, and i want to say one thing that we've been talking about chat gpt and search and one difference is chat gpt maintains state so dennis mentioned you know asking the question and then reformulating it that's very yeah. natural with chat gpt if yeah. if google needs to um, if that's all Google needs to fight, they can, they can, they can do that. You know, next week they can maintain state and let people reformulate their queries. Uh, so that if that's a revolution, which it may be, uh, that'll happen really quickly. All right, Robert Boyd, you have a hand up. Can I get you to unmute? You're still okay. Go ahead and ask. Sure. Hi. Uh, thanks. Well, uh, you know, uh, you talked about uh, having ChatGPT write code for you, and I've been using uh, Copilot for a little while, uh, which is GitHub's, um, uh, you know, OpenAI codex for writing code. And uh, I was using it to write React and Material, which doesn't really matter what it is, but it was new to me. Um, and I learned it quite a bit faster, I think, because it kept me out of the uh, the semantic weeds. If you say, you know, write this kind of code using React and Material UI, <laughs> then it'll give you ten suggestions, uh, and you can you, you can't exactly cut and paste it, but it did make some really interesting suggestions, which uh, of a quality that I've never gotten in an agile meeting where everybody else is sitting <laughs> around and supposed to be commenting on the way you're supposed to. Uh, the best way to solve this problem, but what they're really doing is wondering about their own problem. At least Chat GPT was paying attention to me. Um, but I'll uh, I'll tell you three things that I've seen that it doesn't it kind of doesn't do. You know, you you say write some code like this, uh, and and it will give you a suggestion. But what it won't suggest, what it doesn't know is that, hey, you could have written this code better if you already had a TypeScript interface file or something like that. So it doesn't go backwards. It doesn't say, you know, it starts from where you are and goes forwards a little ways, but it won't go backwards. It's not like a real good mentor who says, well, you don't really need that kind of code. You need this other kind of code to solve that problem. And you need these prerequisites. And it doesn't go very far forward. So it's good for the next five or 10 lines of code. But you know, if you're missing something like, well, you forgot to tell it to include a variable to you know, a, a React thing called use state to maintain the state of all the information that you're using when people are typing it in and changing it. Well, it won't tell you that uh, unless you know that you need that. So there is, there's, uh, there's a good advantage for some of us who were born in 1961, who kind of know all the pieces you do need, but don't really know the semantics or the specific, um, you know, what does material UI have in, to offer compared to semantic and some of the others. It'll come up with those specifics for you. But other than that, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it doesn't really do the mentoring thing quite yet. Um, okay, let's have uh, Dennis. Can I? Okay. 
Sure. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm I'm curious. Getting back to the to the original question of of solar, what I what you would call uh, enterprise knowledge management. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the functionality of ChatGPT seems to come from the fact that it has this this vast textual input petabytes worth. I have no idea how much really. Um, and I'm wondering, sort of, what is the minimum amount of text? that you would have within an enterprise that you could feed into this engine and have it be useful. In other words, is it, 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 it obviously operates at a, at a very great scale when it's, when it's looking at the whole internet, but when it's looking at just what's within an, uh, an enterprise, what is the, how, how much data does an enterprise have to have before it can actually become useful? Does anybody know the answer to that at this point? Well, I, I don't. I know nothing, but I would guess you could do it with small scale, as long as it, as long as it 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 knows semantics and and language structure and uh, grammar from its large model. But does it, it know it, that? Does it know that? In other words, can it transfer that from the large model to a smaller model, or is it or is it a, an engine that just works on what it's given? I would. I, I'm yeah. going to guess it, it can transfer, but uh, I'll, you know, I'll one thing I've noticed that it does is uh, it takes it reads the files that I have in my project and does suggest things related to things in my project that I'm working on now, even if I haven't told it, you know, there's some function in my file, it will it will look for things that seem relevant. So if your company knowledge was in a particular file and you were writing in that context, it probably looks there first. It certainly Stan, does for Copilot. Yeah, Stan or uh, or Dennis, do you have yeah. any? Well, I would say that, as you said, on you could you could do like a pilot by focusing it on a, on a, a set of content, but for it to work the best, you'd probably turn it loose on your intranet and let it crawl and find everything that's there it's going to be a lot of stuff that wouldn't be all that useful but hopefully it can then differentiate and that's the problem with search engines it doesn't differentiate it just throws you out a bunch of stuff that you have to wade through and the advantage of this would be it could look through all of your enterprise content and then figure out using its own algorithms what to do with it and i think the answer would be turn it loose on your whole internet and if necessary Figure out ways of giving it access to things that are that are behind passwords and security, and the more content that you feed it, the better. Dennis, any thoughts? Yeah, I I, I was thinking um, when uh, you were talking about you know the sort of generalized capability versus the specific content that harkens back to like old days of expert systems where there was an inference engine and a knowledge base and. The inference engine was the, the general purpose kind of way of, you know, churning through things. And then the knowledge base was the specific content. So again, I don't know anything about what this tool was like behind the scenes, but if it was ever going to be deployed within an organization, if they hope to sell it that way, I would think you would have to have those two components. You'd have to have the, the basic engine to drive, you know, how it looks at things and, and figures things out in general. And then applying that to the specific um, content of the particular organization. Yeah, I, I would think it, you know, it has a, if it has a digestion, if you give it the, the digestion sy system to a different set of tokens, uh, it, it would kind of work that way. Okay, Tom, you've had your hand up. So uh, let me. Uh, I, I, I had a quick comment question. Uh, I understand that Google uh, made a $300 million investment in a competitor to chat GPT called Claude, I think from Claude Shannon. And this is a constitutional AI. And I'm very interested in the difference between a constitutional AI and this chat GPT, because I, I, I have the feeling that the constitutional AI is going to be more of the uh, uh, expert system type uh, hybrid, but I'm not sure about it. So I was hoping someone would have an answer to that. I had not heard I don't. the term constitutional AI. I yeah, I'm not. I did see that Google, um, something came out just I think today 
they have a tool called BARD and internal memo went out that they got to deploy this internally and start testing it right away. And they're, they're very worried that chat GPT is going to suck up all the, you know, press. And so they've got to get theirs out quickly. So they do have one coming out to compete with it. I, I didn't hear anything about constitutional AI though. So I'm not sure exactly what, what that means. Just ask, uh, that's the answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I okay, just so asked it and it, yeah, it gave yeah. the answer. Yeah. And so, to the idea of yeah. embedding ethical and social value into AI system to ensure they operate in a responsible and fair manner. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, the, the, you know, this whole project started out of, you know, the fear of the uh, you know the paperclip maximizer scenario, um, and it's you know uh, most of the people who who have that fear are, are very angry that that it was kind of let out to the public as soon as it was. Ernie, you had a physical hand up, so you want to you have to unmute, of course. Okay, there yeah, you. yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, a couple of comments, I'll make them real fast. First, uh, for small, smaller companies, they're not going to be able to adopt uh, their own engine because most of it is, uh, requires uh, pretty much massive parallel processing, which requires many, many computers. And uh, if you're a small company and you want to use something like that, you're going to have to use a tool that other users are also using. You're going to have to pay a subscription fee or something to access a general a model of some kind, which brings up a question I've had now for a couple of weeks is, how do you get the chat GPT to sign a non-disclosure agreement? I, I don't know, and, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, my daughter-in-law works for IBM and <laughs> sh she's using it and her groups are using it, but I asked her, what was she doing <laughs> about non-disclosure? Because they're, they're asking it to, to deal with some questions that really ought to be remain private inside the company. So I, I, I'd like to hear anyone's opinions about that, how that's going to work in the, in the future. Uh, secondly, Google is having a meeting on Wednesday, uh, a public, uh, some kind of announcement on Wednesday. And uh, the rumors are that it's about a competitor to ChatGPT. I don't know that that's true or not, but that's what I've heard. And lastly, um, going back to coding, you, I, I've been disappointed recently in some of the things I've asked it to do, uh, mainly because it doesn't quickly interpret a string as a string. You put the string in a, uh, it's like a date. You can write a date uh, out as a string and then tell it you want to use a system date too. Well, we'll use the system date as a date, but it doesn't convert the string to a date, at least in Oracle's database. Uh, unless you put quotes around the date to let it know it's a string. So for novices, they're not going to see that. They're not, they're not going to, I mean, anyone that's going to ask this thing that's not really familiar with the way systems work, it's not going to perform very well. Okay, that's all I have to say. I, I, I am interested in an NDA. Uh, question though. Yeah. Well, I, you know, th that problem kind of precedes uh, this kind of thing. You know, the, you know, I, I started this saying that, that you talked about this chief technology off officer of a big four consulting firm, and it wasn't McKinsey. But when I think of McKinsey, you know, what, the, what they sort of specialize in doing is talking to all the big players in an industry and sort of sharing in a <laughs> in a very careful way with you know what's going on at the other three or with other five players with the sixth player uh you know with with disguising kind of where you know disguising where they're getting their information from it's a it's a very dicey kind of thing um <laughs> and so i think what you're raising I, you know, I don't think it's it can be solved with something as simple as a non-disclosure agreement because McKinsey, you know, just has can't, to can't enforce it. in a detailed way has to know what it can disclose and what it can't, and and it probably crosses the line at least indirectly all the time. Um, okay, uh, Bart, can you unmute and 
ask you a question or give your comment. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to expand on the question from Ernie for the NDA. Um, would you be looking at an NDA for the questions you ask it, or would you be looking for an NDA for maybe previous content you have written before? Like, hey, I do not want my stuff to be indexed or used to train the algorithm to begin with. Where would you be looking for an NDA or maybe both of those situations or yeah, something I, else? I would guess that, that all those possibilities are there. Stan, do you have any thoughts on, you, you, you've you done some consulting. What, 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 how do people deal with, with the just now without um, an AI? Well, I, I haven't had to deal with NDAs much. Um, typically when you're consulting, they may, they may ask you to sign something like that, or they may just say it's part of the work agreement. But I haven't seen it uh, come up in my own experience much. Okay. Um, all right. Any, we're, the queue is open. It's also approaching the end of the hour. So I, um, I'll give, give people like a, a couple moments to come up with any last question okay and i see tom go ahead um yeah i wanted to comment on the knowledge management um i remember 15 20 years ago there was this huge search at uh, dell for the one source of truth which is at the accounting level so right now almost all of these multinational organizations have multiple uh jurisdictional silos of information and they've been doing, uh, trying to organize them in a way so that the president can get an overview. And if there's a section that wants more detail, he go to that detail and uh, get an overview of that section and keep going down uh, and we'll all be consistent. And mm, when I was there 15 years ago, they failed to create such an one source of truth. Uh, when I was at IBM, um, even, eight years ago, they were doing a similar thing uh, with Blue Harmony, which they then gave up on. And now they've gone to something called uh, data in SAP. Uh, and now they've gone to something called uh, data lakes, where uh, they're trying to uh, make a lake of data so that it's available to uh, everybody in the organization. And what I'm certain of is that this AIs which are specialized in the organization, but have the uh, capability of talking like ChatGPT has the capability. Some hybrid mixture of that is going to allow the executives to get rid of a lot of middle managers and thereby, as Arnold mentioned early, uh, raise their personal budget, but lower their headcount. Okay, um, I don't see any of their hands up. Uh, and I'd like to thank everybody for their questions and their thoughts and the, and what the things that they added in chat. And, and I'd especially like to thank Stan and Dennis and uh, give Stan uh, the next to last word and Dennis the last word. So Stan. Okay, so one of the things to point out is that the main use of AI, in my opinion, is to augment human capability, not to replace it. So I think there's a lot of potential for a tool like this to give you something that you could start with and then work from as opposed to just take and always use as is. So in that context, it can save us a lot of time and effort, but we might still want to spend some time checking it, verifying it, and refining it. Okay, and Dennis, the last word. Um, I'll put a link to a paper that's 35 years old uh, but I still find it interesting. And it's the idea that we don't get hung up on the term artificial intelligence. Uh, he makes the case that every technology um, has this habit, uh, every major technology has a habit of first being named in an adjective noun form that relates back to something that's already known. So you had locomotives were an iron horse, a car was a horseless carriage. Um, it, Printing presses were actually originally called artificial writing. Uh, radio was wireless telegraph. You know, so there's this pattern of new technologies 
being named as old things until we figure out exactly what it is and, and realize that it's completely different from anything that we've had before. So when I think people think of this as intelligence, it's not intelligence. It's it's another tool. It's a tool to use for information and um, knowledge uh, management and, and practice, but it's not really intelligence. Okay, well, I'll agree with that and then we'll sign off. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Arnold. Thank you. Bye.